It's an honor to be here to present to you guys. Um, to be honest, I think uh, my approach to Meniere's disease is fairly common, probably very similar to most people's in this room. Uh, though I do think as we learn more and more about Meniere's disease, I think uh, in time how we treat this disease entity will be different than what we do today. Uh, this is a histopathology slide of a human temporal bone, and I just wanted to show you that when we uh, talk about Meniere's disease, we talk about endothelial high drops, and you can see the... Uh, High drops here of the uh, the right membrane broken here. You can see when you get the feeling that it's probably extended. You can see it here in the mid turn of the foot right here, and the mid turn of the foot right here. The right of the mem membrane is uh, extended here in the apical foot and the foot as well. Fortunately, this slide the resolution. I can't really comment on the, the spirogangling cell population in the rosin valves now, or much about the striovascular hair, so the hair cell population. But this is Fairly classic there. Uh, <laughs> cross section. So, the central dogma for uh, Meniere's disease has always been focused on anaphytic hydrops as the initiator and causes episodic dizziness, hearing loss, uh, tinnitus, oral fullness. And the mechanisms have been uh, multifactorial. Some people talk about autoimmune, allergy blocked uh, drainage being the uh, endothelic duct being blocked or excess endolith production, autonomic imbalance, potentially viral cause, anatomy, is there a uh, lateral uh, prominent uh, uh, sigmoid sinus has been noted to, to be a disease entity in certain families, genetic, and also even dietary. Then in the uh, early uh, 2000s, um, Sam Merchant did a study reviewing a lot of the temporal bones at the uh, Mass Ioneer, and he talked about that, well, there's people that have uh, these findings of venothyc hydrops in the cochlea, but they don't really manifest symptoms. So then the phenomena came that perhaps uh, that venothyc um, hydrops is an epiphenomenon. And so what's really going on at the center of this? And, as uh, studies have gone on in the mid-2000s, I think that we kind of come to the conclusion that there's a disruption in the uh, ion hemostasis of the inner ear, or there's a cytochemical perturbation going on in the inner ear that is uh, probably causing the symptoms that uh, patients complain of, again, with respect to dizziness, hearing loss, tinnitus, neural fullness. So the guidelines for Meniere's disease in 1995, they talk about that what is Meniere's disease. It's uh, fluctuating progressive hearing loss. It's episodic uh, rotational vertigo of 20 minutes to 24 hours duration, often accompanied by disequilibrium. There's tinnitus, oral fullness associated with these spells of vertigo as well, and other causes need to be excluded. I would like to comment about uh, vestibular uh, migraine. And I think that uh, migraine uh, patients, uh, it's a great mimicker. You need to keep uh, your eyes open for that. Um, I think what we used to call vestibular Meniere's disease is actually vestibular migraine. And actually, in this country, 1% of our population probably have vestibular migraine. 0.2% of the population have Meniere's disease. And when I finished my fellowship in 2000, I would have never guess that the actual population of, um, of uh, vestibular migraine would be greater than the population for Meniere's disease. And actually, 50% of the patients that have Meniere's disease can have vestibular migraine component as well. So I apologize about this slide here. And this is just the uh, um, academy guidelines for diagnosis of Meniere's disease. They said uh, for certain Meniere's disease, it's, it's uh, definite Meniere's disease with histopathologic confirmation. But obviously, not every patient has Meniere's disease that donates their temporal bone to the histopathology lab to make that confirmation. But definite Meniere's disease is two or more definitive spontaneous episodes of vertigo 20 minutes or longer. There's audiometric uh, data documenting hearing loss in, the, in, a, in at least one occasion of the impacted ear along with 
tinnitus and oral fullness of the ear being treated for Meniere's disease, you want to, of course, rule out other causes. Probable Meniere's disease is one definitive episode of vertigo, along with audiometric documented hearing loss on at least one occasion, along with tinnitus and oral fullness. And again, you're going to rule out other causes. Now, possible Meniere's is an episodic vertigo of uh, Meniere's type without documented hearing loss, or a patient that's got central hearing loss that is fluctuating or fixed with disequilibrium but non-episodic dizziness. Just a couple other things I wanted to mention is about the staging of hearing. Meniere's disease that's staged in four stages, with four being the most severe hearing loss, and it is the average, it's a four-tone average of 500 hertz, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 hertz. It's usually the worst audiogram of the six months prior to when you commence treatment for Meniere's disease, and that's used as your baseline audiogram to utilize when you do comparative studies with your treatment. There's also classification for Meniere's disease with vertigo, and it's classified from A through F, with F being the worst uh, <clears throat> classification. Again, it's the number of spells of, uh, following treatment initiated of 18 to 24 months uh, divided by the average number of spells the six months prior to initiating uh, treatment. And, it, and multiplied by 100, and that comes up with your uh, numerical value here. So again, Meniere's disease, the vertigo typically is in hours. Some patients, 25% of patients with Meniere's are minutes, and the fewest amount is days. Uh, again, it's patients complaining of unilateral oral fullness, tinnitus, they have low frequency, fluctuating, Central hearing loss, which progresses over time. There's recovery usually of symptoms between uh, after 24 hours. Uh, there's a family history of Meniere's disease often, and there is, the, again, the history of some patients may have a uh, migraine headache. So what testing do we do? Well, we do audiometric testing, audio, word recognition we use to help us treat these patients. Uh, also, video and G, we're looking at caloric testing. We're looking to see if there's um, potentially um, uh, horizontal nystagmus. Uh, we use imaging study, the MRI brain ICs with gadolinium. We look at the ECOG. Again, the, we're looking at a, a ratio of 0.4, something greater than 0.4 with summation over action potential would be suggestive of Meniere's disease or an action potential greater than three milliseconds. Uh, ECOG is more sensitive as patients' Meniere's disease becomes more severe. And then there's the cervical VEMP, uh, which is suggestive of uh, sacular function. And that has been demonstrated that the, um, the uh, amplitudes are decreased with patients in the, in the diseased ear. And also that the, uh, the thresholds can be either elevated or absent in the involved ear. So why consider imaging? Well, we want to rule out uh, vestibular schwannoma or cochlear schwannoma. We're looking for infect sac tumors, or we're looking at the labyrinth, looking for cochleitis, vestibulitis, or inner ear malformation. Uh, also hemorrhage in the cochlea, for instance, le leukemia. There's a study from uh, your professor, Hori, from, from uh, Japan, who in 2011 did a very interesting study, and I don't think it's been duplicated, uh, where he um, he um, injected transtepanically or intratepanically gadolinium into the ear um, and then brought the patients back that of Meniere's population and also suffered sudden hearing loss 24 hours later and was able to demonstrate NLFI high drops on the MRI imaging. The algorithm for a Meniere's disease, I don't think, uh, this is an algorithm that I use. Um, it is actually uh, one that uh, Dr. Michael Paparella and uh, Ahmed Sajadi uh, wrote about in 2008. And once you have the diagnosis for Meniere's disease, uh, we all start, I think, with a conservative treatment, which is low cell, or which may be low cell diet and diuretic. Uh, I do not use, uh, and that goes for three to six months, I do not use the Minette device. I had not had much uh, good luck with that. 
I may consider early on if patients are symptomatic from uh, vestibular symptoms, fluctuating hearing loss, and not uh, responding as well as we'd like with respect to low-salt diet and diuretic. I may try oral prednisone or intratepanic uh, dexamethasone. If their symptoms progress and they become more symptomatic, uh, vertigo-wise, then consider uh, anaphylactic sac and shunt surgery. Or another option discussed with them would be uh, intratepanic genomycin or vestibular nerve section. Of course, these patients have uh, very good hearing. Uh, again, I'll go over th all three options with them. If they have uh, poor hearing, I, then I will give consideration to uh, transmastoid labyrinthectomy. Again, with Meniere's patients, we also have to think about the contralateral side as well. So I'd like to present uh, two cases, if, and uh, we'll go through uh, the treatment rationale for these patients. Uh, case one is a 33-year-old male who had uh, episodic vertigo for several months, lasting 20 minutes to one to two hours with some disequilibrium associated with the vertigo, along with uh, initially he had one or two times a month, and then it became more symptomatic three to four times a week. His left ear had oral fullness, he had tinnitus, fluctuating hearing loss with the vertigo symptoms, no history of migraine headaches, no motion sickness, no trauma, non-drinker, non-smoker. He had po positive family history of uh, Furmanier's disease uh, and had taken meclizine but did not benefit him. So the video in G on him demonstrated a left-sided weakness of 33%. There was some direction preponderance, right beating nystagmus of 33%. There was no spontaneous nystagmus. His uh, neuroimaging was negative. And this was his audiogram showing a left-sided low frequency uh, centronal hearing loss with good uh, word recognition score. And so starting off with an algorithm of you know, low salt diet and diuretic. And for conservative treatment, uh, we recommend two gram sodium diet and often we'll have patients uh, visit with a nutritionist to talk about what that entails for a low salt diet. The diuretic, I prefer to use diazide, but I will use uh, Diamox if diazide is not beneficial um, as an, another option. Uh, the suppressant medication, I will use lorazepam or diazepam or meclizine. Encourage patients to uh, drink water, stay hydrated, but also to avoid triggers such as caffeine, chocolate, wine, tobacco. And normally I reassess patients at six months and 80% of Meniere's patients will have uh, responded favorably to this treatment. I know that uh, some people talk about uh, salt intake and they say that as long as you keep the salt intake steady, that that is as effective as the low salt diet. So three months later, the vertigo spells continue three to four times per week, 20 minutes to one to two hours. The left ear is fluctuating with respect to hearing loss and frequency with sev uh, increased severity along in oral fullness and tinnitus. And here's what the autogram is and showing a low frequency loss. And at this point, I would give options to possibly uh, treat the patient with uh, oral prednisone or intratepanic uh, steroid and it's, uh, leave it up to the patient of which they would like to do. Uh, for intratepanic dexamethasone, I use uh, straight up uh, dexamethasone of 10 milligrams per cc and I inject one cc into the middle ear. I numb up the eardrum in the posterior inferior quadrant with phenol and make two small pinholes of a 25 gauge needle and inject one cc. And then I will then turn them to the, on the opposite uh, lateral decubitus position so, and, and leave them there for 30 minutes for treatment. For oral prednisone, I would treat the patient for, uh, with uh, one milligram per kilogram uh, orally in the morning to take their prednisone and for five to seven days. So in this patient, his hearing responded. He had improvement in the hearing. And then it, the patient continues to cycle with a fluctuating hearing loss over the next several months with relatively good word recognition score. One year later, the patient has been treated with two rounds of oral prednisone and two treatments of intratepanic dexamethasone, 
along with continued low salt diet and diacide. The episodes of the vertigo now are every other day and the spells last for 20 minutes to all day with disequilibrium. The left ear hearing continues to fluctuate with progression along with associated oral fullness and tinnitus. Uh, the patient also recently had family illness and has become more symptomatic. And this is hearing again demonstrating a left moderate sensory neural hearing loss with relatively good speech discrimination, but 20% different. And at this time, the options are no change of treatment, consider the Minette device or NLFIX sac shunt procedure, intratepanic genomycin or vestibular nerve section via retrosigmoid or middle fossa approach. And the patient elected to proceed with the uh, lymphatic sac uh, decompression and shunt. And here's a, a drawing demonstrating anatomy of the lateral semicircular canal, posterior semicircular canal, the sigmoid sinus, and the, and the uh, dural bony plate, along with the location of the sac. Here's a mastoidectomy of the left ear and demonstrating the dural plate with the removal of the bone, and you can see the uh, vascularity along the sac, and then the incising the sac and placing of a silastic shunt. After surgery, six weeks later, demonstrating the asymmetric hearing loss, but some, some patients who have sac surgery will actually have some improvement of their hearing and slight improvement of their discrimination, but not all patients. Five years later, the patient was having uh, more vertical episodes and increased severity lasting six to eight hours to one to two days with disequilibrium and continued fluctuating hearing loss with progression along with oral fullness, tentus. The patient was missing days at work due to the Meniere's episodes and the video NG demonstrated a decreased caloric response of 81%. So options at this time are consideration for a Minette device, possibly revision in fact sac shunt procedure, intratepanic genomycin, or consider vestibular nerve section, again, via retrosigmoid or middle fossa approach. And the patient uh, is hearing, demonstrated a left moderate uh, sensory neural hearing loss. Again, with asymmetric word recognition, 80% versus 100% on the good ear. And elected to proceed with uh, intratepanic genomycin. Again, very similar to the intratepanic dexamethasone, uh, numbing the ear drum with topical phenol, making two small pinholes, a 25 gauge needle, and injecting uh, one cc of genomycin of F40 milligrams per cc. I don't buffer it. And then lay them on the opposite, opposite side of the ear in a lateral decubitus position uh, for th 30 minutes. Some of these patients, I instruct them, they can have increased dizziness symptoms after the injection the next day. But <clears throat> usually it, it's not uh, long lasting. Again, typically a day or two, and their symptoms improve. This patient had two intratrepanic genomycin treatments one month apart. I tend to titrate and, and treat patients. Uh, monthly or and depending on how they are doing with their symptoms as opposed to bringing them back uh, doing injections on, on a daily or, or a consecutive day or once a week and space out the treatment when, when it comes to um, gentamicin treatment. Uh, again, this patient uh, had improved bouts of vertigo and his hearing was stable. Here showing the, his hearing, a moderate hearing with relatively unchanged word recognition score. Three years uh, went by, uh, this patient had two left intratepanic genomycin treatments, and vertical spells started to increase with frequency and severity, with several bouts of a Tamarkin crisis, along with progression left hearing loss, and continued oral fullness, tinnitus. The patient was laid off of work because he couldn't function at work. The video NG showed no caloric response, but on ice uh, water caloric testing, he had a small response. This was his hearing, he had progression of hearing, he has uh, a severe hearing loss with a decreased word recognition score of 
And at this point, we discuss with the patient the consideration for um, a labyrinthectomy. And this depiction demonstrates the um, superior semicircular canal, the lateral semicircular canal, and the posterior canal. There's um, here the sigmoid sinus is shown uh, prominently here. Uh, exposed as the bone was removed along with the dural plate. And over here is the dissection demonstrating the superior canal, this lateral canal, the posterior canal. I removed the neuroepithelium with uh, a right angle hook and I also placed a gel foam soaked in, uh, with genomycin into the semicircular canals. I'd like to present one more case. Um, and that is a 25-year-old female uh, with uh, episodes of uh, spinning vertigo several hours to all day along with uh, unsteadiness. The left ear had overflowness, tinnitus, uh, fluctuation hearing associated with vertigo spells. The patient has been treated for nine months with low-salt diet, diacide, and lorazepam. The video in G demonstrated a 46% decrease to left caloric response with some right being nystagmus. The, uh, uh, MRI ICs with gadolinium was negative. And this is the hearing demonstrating a left moderate central neural hearing loss, again with um, a asymmetric word recognition score but good recognition. And the options uh, are uh, continued present treatment, Minette device, uh, oral or intratopanic steroids, anaphylactic sac shunt procedure, uh, or intratopanic genomycin. The patient wants the most effective treatment and, and wants to start having a family. And so I wanted to present this just to discuss the, the option of consideration for vestibular nerve section just for sakes of um, being conclusive in discussion. Uh, I think uh, in a patient of this sense who the, the nerve section may be uh, very helpful in this patient as, a, as it's the patients tend to not uh, resolve their symptoms very well following the operation and can do very well and could be considered in a young patient. Now, uh, whether to do a retrosigmoid approach or a middle fossa approach, it depends on the surgeon. You, know, you do interoperative AVR monitoring, facial nerve monitoring, you have to identify the, uh, the cochlear nerve, the stibular nerves, separation of the nerves, tr uh, you transect the nerves, and you actually re resect a portion of the nerves to complete the neurectomy. The middle fossa of the stibular nerve section may lend to be better results, but there's more complications with potential hearing loss related to the uh, artery in the IAC, as well as uh, potential for facial nerve paralysis. Uh, also, you need to get consideration for a lumbar drain. In these procedures, or do you nick the dura, the dura and then repair it after the, at the, when you're closing? Uh, also, you have to give consideration to the dominant hemisphere. And this just depicts, this is from Jackler's Atlas, and I just wanted to show the uh, retrosigmoid approach here in the cerebellar pontine angle with the resective vestibular nerve, which is rostral to the cochlear nerve. And then this is the middle fossa demonstrating the exposure of the internal auditory canal with the transected, when you do the middle fossa approach, you have to transect both the superior vestibular nerve and the inferior vestibular nerve. You can also resect the, you resect the vestibular nerves and you can resect the scarpus ganglion. And then this is a dissection demonstrating the, the cerebellar pontine angle and the cleavage plane between the vestibular nerve and the cochlear nerve is uh, better delineated towards the porous and so you can separate and dissect the nerves. And the vestibular nerve is more rostral than the, uh, than the uh, cochlear nerve. Typically, the cochlear nerve is more white than the uh, vestibular nerve. I just want to talk about, with respect to the middle fossa approach, I wanted to just mention about the exposure of the internal auditory canal. There's three techniques to consider. One is the fish technique, which the superior semicircular canal forms a, a, um, a 45 to 60 degree angle with the IAC. One technique to, use to localize the IAC. Another approach through the middle fossa is the house technique, which you, you identify the greater super, uh, uh, superficial petrosal nerve 
and outline line it and trace it back to the geniculate, which helps you locate the IC. And the other option is the Garcia Ebenis, which uses the combination of superior semicircular canal and the greater super petrosal nerve, and it forms a 120 degree angle, and you can bisect that angle to delineate the internal canal. Here is the uh, fish technique, and then this is the house technique demonstrating the uh, greater super superficial petrosal nerve back to the geniculate explosion that I see. Oh, one thing is when you do the middle fossa approach, you have to use soft tissue. You can wax the IEC and you can either put muscle in or fat uh, to prevent CSF for the intralog canal. Wanted to also mention about middle fossa approach, obviously contraindications is felt that after above age 60, it's hard to do middle fossa because the dura is fragile. Obviously, if it's your only hearing ear, you're not going to do a vestibular nerve section either by either approach. Uh, also, if you're not able to determine which side, that's going to be a contraindication. But consider uh, seizure disorders uh, when you're doing middle fossa approach and also um, overall health of the patient when you're doing uh, uh, craniotomy surgery. So, treatment of Meniere's disease, the amplified sac decompression, vertigo controls 60 to 70 percent, the hearing loss is 5 to 10 percent. For intratepanic genomycin, vertigo control early on is 95 percent, later on it does decline a bit to 70 percent. The hearing loss can be 20 to 25 percent, again, it depends on how you uh, dose the genomycin. Um, the vestibular nerve section vertigo control is 90%. There's a 15% risk of hearing loss. And labyrinthectomy transmastoid approach, vertigo control is 95 to 98%, but you're sacrificing the hearing. Thank you. Uh -huh.